you go and do this. And I, I mostly go around pretending I didn't have too much to drink. <laughs> and today I haven't had anything to drink, which is really, really unusual for me in, in, by a long way. And I am now a TV presenter on, on, on television. I have the world's greatest job. Brilliantly, and after coming on me about this, I was offered a chance to go and travel the world presenting a TV program on that line, fly here, there, everywhere, all over the place, just drinking, falling over, having a laugh. And I turned it down. <laughs> I properly did the thing of saying no, this is someone else. I'll explain why. But about 25 years ago, I became the wine writer for the Herald newspaper in Scotland. And um, it's a brilliant job. You get lots of samples in and so on. And this guy comes over and says, I read news this way, and I said, Yeah, I am, yeah, I am. And it's uh, just so your job basically is like on a Saturday, the sweet last regions that they might like a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty much my job. A couple of years later, I, I, went, uh, I worked for the Herald, I was with the BBC and stuff, and um, I, did, I do actually have some real qualifications of chartered marketing, to teach marketing and stuff at business school, which is hopefully some of that will kind of go through. I went to work for the PGA in Scotland States, and I told this story to all these authors. And this American guy from our work with the accent, it's terrible, it's in Texas. And he says, um, I told him this story, and he said, oh, how, how times have changed. Uh, they said, yeah, he said, so now you try and persuade large American businessmen that after 18 rounds, of, uh, 18 holes of a round of golf, they might like to have a drink with their mates. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a real challenge now. Do you want me to click there? Yeah, Sorry. it's right there. It's right there, it's right there. Okay, got this sort of picture. And um, because I present this TV show about wine, and I turned it down. And you might wonder why are you said that? I ran a very successful business, I was a sales rep at a big wine company. And they said, Will you present this TV show about wine? And I said no. And I said no for one very good reason. Which bit got click? Right. Is it right? And um, Alan Parchin. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, uh, she doesn't want me to see the kids. Um, I, I, this is absolutely true. Um, I, my partner is Swedish. And as I once said to my mother, she said, What's the age difference between you? And I said, She's 16 years younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> If you are in your mid 40s and you be a really beautiful, lovely person, who's absolutely amazing, and they are 16 years younger than you, do not say that to your mum. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, this is the one where Alan wants to second series. I have spent the last 18 months going, can I have a second series? Can I have a second series? Can I have a second series? We've just got a second series. Unlike Alan. But in the, in the episode, <laughs> Tony Hayes is there and he, they're talking about wine. He says, all these wine people, wine this, wine that. I don't know, this smells of, I don't know, basil. And Tony Hayes comes out this line, he says, I've always wanted to make a genuinely popular online television program. And it was a big media joke. It couldn't be done. You couldn't talk about wine, you couldn't communicate about wine in a way that was genuinely popular on the telly. So when I got a phone call from this producer, I said, no, it can't be done. Everyone's tried. And everybody's thought they could do it. And it's not a thing that can be done. And she said, well, come away with me. We're going to go away and make a little pilot. We can make pilots. And it turned out it was quite good. And I was rubbish, but the pilot was quite good. I bought a barrel of wine for six and a half thousand euros, of course, and absolutely bricked it the whole way through. And we raised lots of money and we made the show and we proved Alan Partridge wrong. So I don't, I might do it later on. Uh, when we have dinner, um, I may have to run around and smell my cheese. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a crown. So, and I am going to go, I'm going to go over on Michael Gove now. Um, because I think the reason why we never made a good TV show in the past is because we relied on experts. And yes, we should rely on experts, but the right sort of experts. So I'm going to turn you all into brilliant wine writers. Okay? Got about 20 minutes, plenty of time. I'm going to teach you all. So put your hands up if you were moderately knowledgeable about wine. Okay? So do you know a reasonable amount? Yes. So there's about, I don't know, a third of the room puts hands up. Keep your hand up if you can tell me what Dactylisperia vitifolia is. <laughs> Good, excellent. You're all perfectly qualified to go and become wine writers. Because when I wrote um, the Hell's Wine Column, one of the things we did, um, it was around the time that Charlie Brooker was writing, uh, you know, sort of early columns, and um, you know, he got Jeremy Clarkson was doing, I don't know if Jeremy Clarkson, 
Uh, he was doing his Sunday Times column, and I said, I don't want to write a wine column, I want to write a really good column that just happens to talk about wine occasionally. And so we used to get these odd briefs, and then when you're on wine writer, you get loads of stuff, loads of drinks sent to your house, so you are instantly an alcoholic. And people, PRs will often say, could you do this with this wine? So I've got this case of Claret, which is red Bordeaux, if you're not familiar with, with Claret, and that's always one of the scattered decisions between Bordeaux and Claret. There isn't one that's the same. It's not very funny. <laughs> so I got this case of Red and the guy said, this PR company said, could you taste this with some ordinary consumers? Um, if one of the things you'll know about me, I hate the word consumer, it's a terrible that I like, can't all cut out that say male 52, you know, divorce, well, I'm not 52. Um, <laughs> so the, the thing came through, and I was sitting there, I was chatting, I used to co write with a guy called Tom Shields, a legendary journalist, he's got an old, dirty, sort of proper, hard bitten journalist. And I said, well, maybe we should go and get in touch with a more guy tasting group or something. He went, fuck off. <laughs> That was his kind of way. And so what are we going to do with it? He said, no, 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 take it downstairs to the press bar. And the press bar, for anybody who remembered it, was in the old Herald building. There's a guy who refused to sell his pub when they demolished the street and built the Herald building. So he literally got a brand new one, sent his building, and in it is a Victorian pub. <laughs> and it's filled with journalists, filled with two groups, journalists, who are all sort of dirty and smelly and they will smoke, and the homeless, who are slightly less dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so we took this down. This was in the early 90s, so don't judge me. I took um, about two cases of wine and gave it to lifelong alcoholics who had no home to live in. They went to the Salvation Army Hospital, and we did it for the edification of middle class people. <laughs> <laughs> we gave these homeless guys all this wine, and it was fascinating because what we found was they started to talk about wine in a way that was, was totally different. They, fundamentally, they talked about three things. Firstly, they decided whether they liked it or not. Oh, that's brilliant. Shite. <laughs> <laughs> and they talked, the way they talked about it, and this was weird, is they talked about it in terms of their status in society. A lot of them talked about how this was too posh for somebody like them. This is too smart for me. I'm not the sort of person who drinks dick. They got placed their own position in the hierarchy relative to this kind of drinking. And then the they talked a lot about. Um, <coughs> Well, maybe we could drink this in the middle of the day, or, you know, I really like this sort of pie. All we have is little, little mince pies. They sort of, this is good with the pie. And they talked about kind of what they do with it. Anyway, I sort of chewed over this a little bit, because I really hate this. Now, firstly, this is, I'm not going to knock it away, this is award-winning wine writing. This guy just won an award earlier on this year. He's an um, Australian writer. Uh, this is one of his structure, <coughs> one of his uh, notes. This is classic wine writing, and in its context, I think this is good, but its context is pretty narrow. Um, it's all aromatic, delicate, cut red fruits, wild strawberries, more rustic notes of nutmeg and bush herbs. Bear in mind there are four tasting aromas there. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, there's also stuff, stuff about a whole bunch of fermentation, whatever the hell that is. <laughs> Clacking boiled blackberry, <laughs> sweet against your teeth, and low yield. Oh, no. um, and so, <laughs> it is one proud Pinot Noir. Now, in its context, that's pretty good. This is an even better one. This is got by a guy called Neil Martin. I love Neil, he's a good guy. He is probably the world's most influential wine writer. <laughs> or, um, uh, from robertparker.com. This is about the feet of 2010, the expensive wine. I've only had a couple of months. It costs about, I don't know, a couple of grand bottles, something like that. Um, and to like this, it's got this stuff. I mean, it's a wonderful definition of generosity. Though blind, I was airing towards Mouton rather than the feet. Explanation mark. <laughs> with a sensual, caressing entry. <laughs> I've spent years trying to do a Frankie Howard face from Pompeii. <laughs> I, I have to tell you that I think that the sensual, caressing entry is possibly why we have um, amazing tension that's extraordinarily long and persistent <laughs> Uh, 
and it's good that just all that kind of stuff. And notice he's got lots of testing stuff in Red Chair's kind of disease. This is written, we, we talk a lot in the wine world about 5%, this is written for 5%, about 5% of people are really, really into wine. That is, the, that is, if you like, the gold standard of copy of some description within the world of wine. That's what we sell wine with, it's things like that. And it relates to about 5% of people in the wine world. And when we were doing the show, one of the great challenges we had, we knew we were going to go on a channel like ITV, we had to talk to the 95%, we had to talk to a totally different group of people. And I was writing for the Herald, I'm talking to Glaswegians. I've got to talk to a really sort of 95% audience. So knowing what I did, I didn't want to do that. I knew the stuff about my homeless people. I had to think, is there a way we can think of talking about wine that relates to normal people and is, it's not really kind of rooted in consumers that were drinkers rather than professionals like me. And I looked around, I genuinely did all the stuff. Plato had absolutely no good words to say about wine writing. He thought it was a total waste of time. Aristotle wasn't much better. Horace writes about wine, but all he says is whether it's good or bad, and funny enough talks about social class, quite often sort of a humble wine or it's an aristocratic wine. Uh, Samuel Pepys, exactly the same, it's like a most particular vintage, but it's sort of, he talks a lot about past you know, uh, groups. So I needed somebody who's a much more modern, maybe you know, a kind of great thinker of the age, but somebody who would maybe have an insight into the world of <laughs> uh, <laughs> writing and social <laughs> I discovered, because when I was writing this stuff, I had to do this part-time job again and doing a bit of copywriting, and I was reading all Andy's books. And particularly, the most basic kind of model of all, no field committed. And it suddenly struck me that within this kind of model, no, is it good or bad? And is there a way we can tell whether or not people are going to think it's good or bad? Is there some sort of insight in that? Feel, that thing about social class, it's because there's an emotional connection. I am a tramp. You know, I feel that this is above me, but actually there's much more other ways. You know, it's an aristocratic wine. Here's a context I can understand it. Commit to what do I do? Do I drink at parties? Do I have a bit of pie? Do I, do, you know, I remember once getting a reader's letter. I mean, it was the week that there was no editor in the paper, and somebody complained that I never wrote um, food and wine matching notes. Anyway, I sent my copy, and I'm, I'm really good at writing copies. If they say 813 words, it's 813 words, and it just slots straight in. This guy said he never even read it. Because he said your copies were really good, and we didn't have to you know, sell it and stuff. And we were in a bit of a hurry, so they slotted it in. And um, the, the uh, new editor came in, and there's this massive pile of letters and emails. And he came in, and uh, they were all complaining about my column. And it's because we had a pudding wine, and I'd say, I said, somebody's complained that I never say how many you should enjoy it, and any of these wines, and the food you should go with. This is ideally served with a sexual partner in a bath. <laughs> <laughs> How do you take your coffee this morning? I don't take coffee at all. Don't take coffee. A chai sort of tea. 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 Oh, good. Interesting. Okay. Coffee this morning. Tea. <coughs> Extra tea hot. Skinny latte. Skinny latte. Is there any espresso drinkers? A few espresso drinkers. Sort of espresso flat white sort of thing. Right. Roughly. Those of you who are espresso flat white black coffee, no milk, hands up. Something like that. I'm one of those. Good. Okay. Cappuccino, strong latte, milk, coffee with milk, hands up. Which we'll side more are you? Okay. Don't like coffee really at all. Um, yes. Are there any people it's a mocha latte cappuccino with extra caramel and <laughs> sugar and sweet or anything like that? Really sweet ones. <laughs> you! You! <laughs> There's a man! There's a man. <laughs> <Artists>. <laughs> I know, he touched me. <laughs> Bring your mum. Are you bring your mum? Yeah. Bring your mum and say, I'm really sorry. you <laughs> um, The morning sickness is what you're apologising for. Uh, there is about a 98% chance that your mum had crippling morning sickness when she was very good. Male hypersensitive tasters. One of the things I've got with Andy is that understanding of neuroscience and physiology and so on is often really important to writing coffee. It's not about what we feel, it's about what we know. Uh, this is the standard coffee test. This tells you more about the coffee, the wine you're going to like than anything else. So there are three groups. Hypo tasters are all of those of us who drink black coffees and espresso. We don't have very many taste buds. We have about 2,000 taste buds. Imagine the volumes turned really down for us. The music's the same, but the volume's really down. So we like to have quite loud music, okay? Normal tasters, so half the population. 
That's why Pacino's and Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc that are really middle of the road, that's why people like that. Because most people have about 5,000 taste buds, or something like that. Super tasters, that's the people who can't drink coffee, or people who like lattes and really milky coffees, and they don't really like that bitterness. You have about 8,000 taste buds. Bear in mind that is a fourfold difference from the hypo tasters. Is it any wonder that some people really like some wines and some people really hate them? And you, the volume's turned right up. So you want pretty quiet wines like Pinot Grigio's and Beaujolais and things. But it's not necessarily those, but you just don't like to go and have these sort of huge, overwhelming tastes. One weird thing is the only people in the world who can like the most expensive wines in the world are hyper tasters. So only about a portion of the population likes very, very expensive wine because they're massive, huge, big fruit bomb thing, massive tannins. So you can do this little test. You can go and dye your tongue blue, and if you have lots of blue, then you're a hyper taster. And if you have lots of little dots, then you're a hyper super taster. And if you have a very sweet palette, and there's only two or three of you in the room, it's actually a very small part of the population then you are the people who just really like sweet things. And I'm really sorry, wine lists tend not to serve you terribly well, very much at all. So this started to get me into this sort of idea that we are able to go and understand what people, the sort of no bit will be, what people will actually enjoy when they're going and trying wines. So if you were able to go and do the coffee test, you'd be able to say wines are big or small or somewhere in between, then you're sort of getting much further on. In terms of saying, you'll like this. So we start off with that sort of area. So I started writing a bit, we were doing the show, and we kind of played around with this model. In fact, in series two, there's one episode where we go and do the, 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 the sort of test, and we, we go and uh, I give Gina Yashu a comic from uh, Athens. She and I go off to, uh, to California, and we, we, she makes me do it. Oh, I won't tell you. Anyway, she makes me do something that um, absolutely makes me shake my hands. Um, <laughs> I go and teach her a little bit about wine. So we knew that we were getting somewhere in terms of this, uh, this sort of structure. <coughs> but we then get into this area of flavour. This was a quote that I picked out the other day. Because Daniel and I started coming around saying, lots of people talk about flavour, and listen, we hypothesise it's the limit of perceptual grouping or pattern recognition abilities in the piriform cortex that places enough. Cut that back, you can only taste three things. <laughs> you remember what I said about the four bits? You can't taste four things. You can't smell four things. You cannot do it. It's impossible. People are unable to do it. This is one of the great new developments in neuroscience and uh, the perception of taste. What happens, boy, just swallow now. And can you feel at the back of your tongue sort of flapping a bit? This is what, in wine terms, is known as the flavour burst. When you take wine in, your tongue only tastes five things, sweet, sour, salt, bitter, umami. All the aroma happens up here in your nose, but there are two bits to it. First, it goes up into your nose. That's why wine merchants do that. They're sort of sniffing the... <laughs> so all the aromas go up. Now, first is the analytical bit. The the probes, if you like, in your nose detect lots and lots of different aromatic chemicals. And we always used to think they went up into your brain, and your brain went, oh yeah, there's some of that, some of that, some of that, some of that. It doesn't work that way. All these things go up in your brain, and there's perceptual grouping and pattern recognition in your piriform <coughs> cortex, which is kind of front, and there is an upper bound on that mixture analysis. Your brain just runs out of processing capacity. It cannot work out more than three. So if you would describe wine with more than three things, you kind of fit it. What you're doing is you're saying, well, if I get maraschino cherry, there's probably other forest fruits that are in there, so I'll name some of those other bits. <coughs> so this has been this quite interesting development for wine professors like me, who traditionally have said, oh, we've come up with lots and lots of different aromas. We can't. You shouldn't. It's terrible copywriting. Why do people think they can do it? You, as real experts in copywriting and being able to talk about words, now, no, you can't. If you describe one three aromas, you're lying. Pure and simple. I, just made, I once did a taste of a bit like this, and it was at the Country Living Spring Fair. And I got all the ladies to do that slurpy, swirly thing. And the problem is I should have done it with white wine. 
Because <laughs> you put it all there, and, the, the, and that's what you do. You take it in your mouth, you sort of knock your head forwards, and then you, you suck up through there, and you kind of breathe out of your nose this sort of aerosol. There's all these middle aged things, all they like in twin sets. And then there's this one on the front row, and just a. <laughs> <laughs> magnificent sort of person in the wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> To her, and she did that thing for four days of food. <laughs> so, why is it then that we come up with lots of words? It's this person. Why do wine writers come up with lots and lots of terms? And this is where wine is not the only area where this happens. It's where experts kind of know too much. So, they've got Anne C. Noble. Anne C. Noble joined the University of California Davis Enology Faculty, Enology and Science of Wine in 1974, and she got really sort of heads up about people using imprecise words to describe wine. In particular, one of the words that she got really cross with was elegant. So people describe wine as elegant. She said it's imprecise, it doesn't describe anything. And if you look behind her, this is her great gift to the world of wine. It's called the flavour wheel. I'll just click it on that, is the uh, Roman Master flavour wheel. What she did was she did a series of benchmark tests. They had glasses, which would have tobacco in them and strawberries and this and that. And people had to learn them so that they could recognise those aromas in different contexts. And it was to create a common language so that when you were discussing wine analytically, you were able to talk to other professionals and they knew what you were talking about. It's a really scientific approach. <coughs> I'll give you one particular example. If you look down in vegetables, green pepper, a lot of these are effectively proxies for very specific things. Green pepper is a group of chemicals called pyrazines, and when you're a winemaker, if you have pyrazine characters, it means that you are either deliberately or not trying to introduce a slightly underripe fruit character. British uh, palates quite like pyrazine characters, American palates really hate them. So I'm there as a winemaker, say, so, well, you know what, it's quite nice, it'll work for you well in America, but I need a bit more pyrazine character. I would use the common term. Green pepper to say that you know that. Uh, if you come across this side, if we're looking at um, this area here, malolactic fermentation, one of the great bugbears of anybody talking about wine, because it sort of introduces this idiotically scientific sounding bit. Yogurt or butter, which is diacetyl. So somebody goes and they say, rather than say diacetyl, what they say is, do you get a kind of luxury character? And I underline it because he likes white burgundy, and white burgundy often has this slightly yogurty, buttery character because they. It's not actually a fermentation at all, it's a uh, bacterial conversion, but you don't need to worry about that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what happened is wine writers, people writing wine copy, who are on the whole in industry experts, so totally imbued with who tend to only ever hang out with other wine professionals, they went mad. <laughs> this is the sort of jargonal wheel of the wine world. So rather than coming and talking about strategic re-engineering and all that kind of stuff, where people come up with absolute bollocky terms to make their job as a little manager from Basingstoke sound a bit more glamorous, why people came up with these? And they would start and they would say, well, how many of these can I cram in my copy? Even though <coughs> we know that it's sort of pointless to go and do that. We know it's, people can't go and perceive it because they, they're only going to get three. And then there's that sort of deep, I need to remember that Julie Gordon business, you know, she's all the barrel loads of money for that kind of stuff. And people would caricature it, those tramps, you know, those tramps, the homes. Too late. That's it, real ones. The one time they ever used a flavour descriptor was to caricature people like Julie Gordon. That was the only time they ever used it. Deep down, we know it's bollocks. We don't know why we know it's bollocks, or we do now, because we now know the upper threshold for flavour press perception is three, so when something comes out of five, we know they're in our soul talking backwards. So, um, which words should you use? Here we have a bit of research. There's very little research on what words people really should use. And this is what comes up. I just want to show you one. In the top ten, elegant. <laughs> It turns out the words that they rejected are words that people really, really like to hear. The number one is fruity, number two is smooth, full-bodied. They're those words that describe how it feels and they have a sort of an emotional resonance for people. I did a little bit of research. When we talk about wine people, 
I think this is a Google image search for people drinking wine. Most of our perception of how we think about people drinking wine is this kind of stuff. Young people drinking wine in parties. You know, two of the biggest things are people, young people don't drink wine, they drink other stuff. They rarely drink it in parties when they go out. I actually went and did a person drinking wine. There is only one picture here that I think has any real relevance. <laughs> because this is not sort of volume so much, but this is um, not being probably released, so I'm going to show you some brand new stuff. I said, is there a better way of knowing what pe when people drink and why they drink stuff? And hopefully it's not just because they're really depressed and they're well. <laughs> This was some research done about uh, weekday occasions. Fundamentally, it's with dinner and while watching the telly. That's why people drink. That's when they drink the weekend. There's only one other exception. Um, on Sundays, people drink at lunchtime. But all that stuff about people going out and being with their mates and stuff, they don't. They, walk, they, they have it with supper and when they're watching the telly. That's when people drink in Britain. So the Google image search is selling a total fib. It's, it's a lie. Why do they drink? This is that kind of need state research. Anyone done need state research before? You know, why do people drink? We think that people drink to show off, you know, prestige, like James Bond. Yeah, about, what is it, four and a half percent of people drink. <coughs> we think that it's because they're having a fun night out at 1.8%. We even think, just a lot of people are Christians, you know, Christian culture, we think it's a bond with people. It's not. People drink because it's relaxing and they want to indulge themselves. I remember Andy reading about you know, the seven deadly sins, I can't remember if it's a deadly sin, but fundamentally, wine is a wine from a glass. <laughs> <laughs> it's relaxing. It's for me. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're trying to get under the, the skin of consumers. That's who wine drinks are. 